So last week we kicked off a new series called As For Me and My House. And we're talking about the different relationships in our lives. Check out this video to get us started. So we're in this series called As For Me and My House. And what we're doing is we're looking each week at a different room of the house, which really symbolizes the relationship that primarily happens there. And so today we're here in the master bedroom talking about marriage. And uh, we thought as we get started, Claire and I would kick it off with a little bit of marriage trivia. Claire, purse? iPad. iPad or I'd phone? I'd grab the kids. I would grab the kids if the house was on fire. I don't think of our kids as being a thing. <laughs> they are people. If you could describe your spouse in one word, what would it be? Go. Curvy. <laughs> a leader, great leader. <laughs> if your spouse was an animal, Bear. Fox. <laughs> Is that a 70s foxy lady yes. kind of thing? Mm -hmm. Ah, thank you. If you had to move in with one of your parents, which parent would you mm. We'd be homeless. <laughs> I said your dad. If you were giving your marriage a grade, what would it be? I'd give it an A. I'd give it an A. <laughs> Now guys, you'll be glad to know that uh, Claire wanted us to film this video under the covers, but I said, nope, we got to keep it PG. <laughs> That's why we're on top of the covers. On top of the covers. Yeah, church shoot. So we've been married 23 years, like I said, and, and definitely, you know, no marriage is perfect, yeah. but I say our marriage has, has most of the time been pretty great. And I think one thing, uh, one reason for that, obviously, all the good stuff's God, but I, I think <laughs> I think one big part of that for us is that we've been on the same page from day one yeah. that this would be the most important human relationship, more than uh, our relationship with uh, our extended family or our kids or other friends. And I, and I think us being on the same page on that has really guided and directed so many of the choices that we've made that's, that's led to 23 years of pretty great. Yeah, I totally agree that you've got to prioritize your marriage because there's so many things in life and just life's challenges, kids, job, all different things that can come in the way of that. And I think it is super important to prioritize your marriage relationship and make the investment you need to make to make it good. So guys, Claire and I are excited this morning to talk to you a little bit more about marriage in today's message. Hey, it's good to have uh, Claire with me on stage. Let's welcome her, yeah. Is there anything you want to say as we get rolling? I think we're good. All right, very good. Just wait. So, uh, hey, talk about marriage. No relationship in your life will make a bigger difference over the overall trajectory and quality of your life than your marriage. It'll uh, impact you financially. It'll impact your mental health, emotional health. It impacts your spiritual health. Peter tells us, tells husbands, he says, hey, if you don't treat your wives right, then God doesn't even hear your hair, hear your hair, hear your prayers. And, uh, and uh, God doesn't even hear your prayers. It affects you spiritually. It, it's studies, oh, after studies shown that the quality of your marriage affects you physically, get this, University of Michigan study said that an unhappy marriage increases your chance of getting sick by roughly 35%. And will even shorten your life by an average of four to eight years. Now, the good news there is you won't care that you died early because you were in an unhappy marriage. And so um, the flip side, people who are happily married live longer, healthier lives than either divorced people or those who are unhappily married. A happy marriage has been shown to lower your risk of developing cancer, having a heart attack, or being diagnosed with dementia and other various diseases. And so there's a lot at stake with the quality of our marriages. And so we're just going to talk to you today, just give you five difference makers in your marriage, just big picture, five things that we believe will make a big difference in the quality of your marriage. Here's the first thing. If you have your Bibles, go over to Hebrews chapter 13. Here's your first difference maker. Choose to honor marriage. Writer of Hebrews says this, let marriage be held in honor among all 
So that means if you're married or single, widowed or divorced, wherever you find yourself, honor the institution of marriage because it was God's idea, God's invention. He says, let let marriage be honored by all and let the marriage bed be undefiled for God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterous. And so we live in a culture today that dishonors marriage, a a culture today that, that, that diminishes the importance of marriage, a culture today that redefines what marriage even is. But, but God says, one thing you need to do is you need to honor marriage. And, and uh, you kind of get a, a picture uh, of the attitude of, uh, that, that the culture uh, many hold towards marriage. I, I came across an article written by a lady named Alice Gregory. She writes for the New York Times. She wrote this article in The Atlantic. Here's what she says about her marriage. She says, my husband and I got married last fall because we wanted to have a party. Not a good reason to get married. Um, <laughs> I doubt our friends, our family, or anyone else would, we know would have been surprised if we'd never done it at all. If we'd continued living together, loving each other, one day having children, all without exchanging rings. And so some people think marriage is about a party. Other people think it's about, it's a, about jewelry. Other people think it's about a certificate. And he said the wedding was ideal. Great cake, accessible. And he says it was close for easy people to get to from the subway. And he says, but our life didn't change after it was over. It never occurred to us that I would take his name. I didn't want to and didn't get pregnant. We live in the same small Brooklyn apartment that we lived in before, and our finances are still only haphazardly half combined. We weren't expecting that our affection would either grow or diminish, and it hasn't. Getting married wasn't a romantic leap, neither was it merely or even mostly a pragmatic step. Whatever it was, get this, delightfully unnecessary wrapping on an already very good present. This idea that marriage is primarily about a party or primarily about jewelry or primarily about a certificate or tax breaks or, or that it's just kind of this uh, unnecessary, delightfully, uh, just the wrapping to a, an already good present, that, that, that marriage is, can, can be those things, but it is so much more than those things. And so if I'm going to honor marriage, I need to understand the nature of marriage. And, and that I think a working definition of marriage from a biblical perspective is that marriage is a covenant that's a monogamous, lifelong love relationship between a man and a woman. And so really we have to decide, am I going to look at marriage through the lens of a consumer relationship or a covenantal relationship? See, a, a consumer says, I, I'm in this as long as it works for me. See, I don't have a covenantal relationship with the grocery store Rayleigh's. Chances are, as soon as the new Safeway opens, I will literally never go there again because it will now serve my needs better to be more convenient, closer to home. I will go to Safeway. And so it's a consumer relationship. As long as it's working out for me, as long as the cost-benefit analysis is going my direction, I will continue in a consumer relationship. But a covenant says, I'm in this for as long as I shall live. The consumer says, what can I get out of this individually or personally? Covenant says, what, what can I give to this relationship or the other person? Let me give you a quick disclaimer. Now, if I'm out there hearing a, a message like this, and there's five points, and uh, I'm t- typically timing the first point and then doing the math. So the first point goes 14 minutes. I'm like, are we really going to be here for 70 minutes today? But I want to put your mind at ease. The first point is by far the longest. So everyone just kind of exhale in that relief right there. <laughs> All right, so um, what is, uh, to honor marriage, I need to understand the nature of it. It's a covenantal relationship, not a consumer relationship. And then I need to understand what are some of the purposes of marriage. Um, So we see a handful of these in the scripture. One purpose of marriage is to deal with the issue of loneliness. Now, Galatians chapter 2, verse 18, as we look at the creation account, God creates everything, says it's good, it's good, it's good. First time God says something's not good, he says it's not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper. Now, some women throughout history have looked at this verse and said, and referring to the wife as a helper and seen it as demeaning, but let me just put your mind at ease. That, that same word helper, God uses to define him, to describe himself. And so you could, if you're a narcissist, you can read it and say, I will make him a God-like helper helper for him. It's a uh, laugh with me, folks. It'll be more fun. And so, uh, but it, it is, it's not a demeaning term. God uses it to speak of himself. But what we see here is that God says it's not good for people to be alone, this loneliness thing. And so part of the issue of marriage is to deal with loneliness. Part of it is, is it's about the, uh, about having kids, procreation and raising children. We also see this in the creation account, Genesis chapter one, we see God's first command. And God blessed them, and God said, be fruitful and multiply. God's first command is is have sex and make babies. He says, be fruitful and 
multiply. So part of the issue of, of purpose of marriage is to deal with loneliness. Part of it is related to procreation and having kids. Uh, part of it, we see in the rest of this verse, uh, has to do with the flourishing of society. He says, fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. It's this kind of picture uh, of, kind of, uh, of kind of this idea of, of kind of creating stable, flourishing society, which is one of the things that marriage does. It's really God's first institution. That's the foundation of every other institution. The marriage is the foundation of the family, which is the foundation of society. And, and that marriage actually has been shown that where marriages thrive, society thrives. In fact, I saw an article in a, a secular magazine just talking um, kind of from some of the economic and societal benefits of marriage. In fact, the, the title said, said if, you, if you want to help America's economy and yourself at the same time, get married. Here's some of the stuff, things it says. It says, the advantages of raising kids in a stable household are well documented. Children of married parents are more likely to graduate high school, less likely to go to jail, and more likely to delay sexual activity. Kids from single-parent homes are five times as likely to live in poverty. Men who marry, research has shown, are more productive at work, are paid better, and are more likely to be employed than their unmarried counterparts. Economist Stephen Moore pointed it out this way. It says marriage, none of these things that he's about to reference are, are bad in and of themselves. It says marriage is a far better social program than food stamps, Medicaid, public housing, or even all of them combined. Obviously, there can be some need for those things, but the idea is that, that marriage is such a powerful force for personal stability and flourishing and, and for the flourishing of society in general. We have actually have a couple in this service, Ken and April. Next month, we'll be married on February 13th, 60 years. Let's give it up for those Congratulations. guys. Congratulations. Uh, 60 years. And so there's this aspect of marriage deals with loneliness. It's about having kids. It's about the flourishing of society. And then there is this aspect of enjoyment, which we'll talk more about in a minute. Marriage makes us more like Jesus. If you're a follower of Jesus uh, um, and you've given your life to Christ, you're on this lifelong journey. The, uh, the Bible calls sanctification. It's this process where we become more like Jesus all throughout our whole life until the moment where we are with him and then we're like him. But it's this process where we're becoming more like Jesus. And I believe it's true that outside of the work of the Holy Spirit and the, and the work of the scripture, for, for most of us that are married, the single biggest tool that God will use to make us more like himself is our spouse as we learn to love them. And, 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 and so for Claire and I, there's no doubt that, that, that God has used Claire to help me become so much more like Jesus. You're welcome. Um, and so, uh, and then finally, the biggest, and, the biggest, and, uh, biggest and most important the Bible tells us that, that one of the primary purposes of marriage. See, again, it's more than just personal fulfillment. It's more than just economic advantages or tax breaks or a party or a piece of paper. The, the biggest the purpose for marriage, the Bible tells us, is that it reflects God's love for us. In Ephesians chapter 5, it reads this way. It says, therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother, Paul quoting from, from the Genesis account, and, and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. See, see, for some people that, that don't he, you know, hear uh, clearly um, the, the message of the gospel, the good news of God's love for us in Christ, for some people, the clearest picture of God's love they'll ever see is a Christian marriage. I heard it described like this. Uh, years ago, there in, in the UK, there arose a dispute between two government offices, the foreign office and, and the treasury. The argument about was about what, which British ambassadors would be provided with a Rolls Royce for their official duties in a foreign capital. The Treasury, unsurprisingly, wanted these wonderful cars restricted to a few. Maybe Washington, Moscow, and Paris, just the most important relationships. The Foreign Office argued for far more based on the following reasoning said this, most people in a foreign capital have never been to the UK, they said, but when they see this magnificent car gliding through their streets with the UK flag on the hood, they will say to themselves, I have not been to Britain, I don't know much about Britain, but if they make cars like that there, then Britain must be a wonderful place. Author went on to say, in a similar way, it's Christ's hope that men and women may say to themselves as they watch a Christian marriage... I've never seen God. Sometimes I wonder when I look at the world if God is good or if there is a God. But if he can make a man and a woman love one another like this, 
if he can make this husband and wife show costly faithfulness through good times as well as bad times, sickness as well as health, richer and poorer, if he can give them the resources to love each other with Christ-like sacrifice, well, then he must be a good God. That would give us point two. The next difference maker in your marriage is to create realistic expectations. On this whole topic of, topic of expectations, this is huge in marriage because I think there is this kind of dance that we do in marriage of, of expectations and fulfilling them and then not fulfilling them and then having disappointment and having to constantly readjust. And there's three main areas I want to talk to you about on expectations. Having unrealistic expectations, uncommunicated expectations, and unmet expectations. So unrealistic expectations. That is just, we are flooded with messages of how marriage should be, that it should be perfect, that both of these people should magically know what the other one needs and meet those needs. We see romance novels, pornography, movies, things like that. And, and those romance novels, ladies, that this man, burly man comes in and just says every word that woman ever wanted to hear, a woman wrote that. So that's why that happened that way. So we kind of have this thing that we, we idealize this perfect marriage, and the reality is that's just not true. The Bible shows us couples over and over again that are human, that have faults, that there's lies, there's manipulation, there's different things because we're all sinners. And we have to come into the, at the marriage with realistic expectations. The second thing that gives us a problem are uncommunicated expectations. And so this was a revelatory moment in our marriage when I kind of felt a lot of frustration about Dave and um, he is amazing. But at this time, I was like, why isn't he doing this? And how come every time I do this, he does this? And why isn't this? And why isn't this? And I was just experiencing this frustration that kept building. And then someone told me, uh, this counselor said, well, have you, have you told him that? Like, have you told him? that you expected this? And I was like, well, no, if he loves me, surely he should know. And the reality is that's just not true, guys. Um, that's just not true. None of us are mind readers. You've got to have communication. You have to communicate your needs. It's kind of like this. Like if we walked into Cold Stone and I was really, really, really craving a founder's favorite made with cheesecake ice cream with the pecans, brownies, caramel, and chocolate sauce on, in a waffle cone, which that is the best. If you ever have it, you need to try it. It's awesome. And I walk in there, and that's what I want, but I just look at the person and say, give me some ice cream. And then they just figure, you look like a chocolate person, whatever, and they make me, and then I get mad at them. Like, this isn't what I wanted. I mean, that's ridiculous, right? Like, who does that? But that's what we do in our marriage. We go to our spouse, and we have, like, there's all these needs that we have and ways we expect things to go, but we never take the time to communicate that to them. And I know it ruins the romance. It's okay. Um, the more you communicate up front and you get to understand what the other person expects, then it, they'll, they'll learn and it'll get better. It's not like you have to do this all the time. And it's not creating a list of demands that you want that person to meet. Um, it's more like talking about, you know, what are our expectations for our roles with our kids? Or, um, you know, gosh, when I'm really crying and upset, it really makes me feel good when you just hug me and don't ask me questions or um, just really affirming the good things that they're doing and then they'll do them again. Um, that helps a whole lot. Um, Claire's learned that when I do the right thing, if th she throws a parade for me, yes. I'll do it again. And so... Uh, That's the secret. If you want it to happen, pr uh, certainly applaud it and celebrate it and yeah. throw a party. Yeah. Lots of parties around our house. So anyways, but... The, the other thing is, like, even after all these things are communicated, there still comes a point where your spouse is not going to meet your every need. And that's because God created needs in you that can only be met by him. And so we put this unrealistic expectation on our spouse to meet needs that only God can meet for us. You could be sitting next to an amazing spouse and still feel lonely deep in your heart because there's something else going on there that God wants to meet that need for you. And I think that a lot of times we consciously or subconsciously expect our spouse to get to meet those needs for us, like significance. God gave his son for you. He died on the cross for you to tell you that you are worthy. You don't need your spouse to tell you that. You need to hear that from God. Great. Third truth is this. If you're gonna, a difference maker in your marriage is make time 
for friendship and passion. Uh, study after study has shown that, that the single biggest difference maker in terms of long-term quality of a marriage is, is the quality of the friendship. And, and so Claire and I are, are each other's best friends. There's nobody I'd rather spend time with than Claire. When we have free time and, and the ability to spend time together, we always choose each other. Uh, and, and so that's, there is, and that's been shown, study after study has shown, if you want to have a great marriage, that, then have a, a, an enduring, deep, meaningful friendship. And so many times what happens is the things that we do in order to get married, the things we do while we're, while we're dating, once we get married, we stop it all and then wonder why the feelings we had before we got married have, have gone away. And, and so there is this thing about making time. And as life gets busy and as you have kids, you, you've got to make that a priority, to make time for friendship and to make time for passion and Especially when you've got a bunch of kids, and Claire and I have got a bunch of kids. We, we were blessed the other day. The road has kept our three little kids, so Claire and I could have, have, have the whole evening together, and then the next morning, it, you've got to be intentional like that, and, and to create time for friendship, and, and then to create time also for passion. And let me show you Proverbs chapter 5, in this passage here, Solomon is warning his son about the dangers of adultery. And, and, and the principle that Solomon is, is going to, to be giving to his son is this, that the greatest cure for sex outside of marriage is sex inside of marriage. Here's what it goes. He says, he says drink water from your own cistern. It's, it's, it's this picture here. He's like, man, don't drink someone else's water. Drink your water. He's saying, have, have sex with your wife. Flowing water from your own well. Should your springs be scattered abroad, streams of water in the streets, let them be for yourself alone and not for strangers with you. And then he kind of goes away from the, 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 uh, the mysterious metaphors and how he gets really clear. He says, let your fountain be blessed. And any, I don't know if any of you are looking for a life verse. Here comes one. He says, and rejoice in the wife of your youth. And this idea that marriage is to be enjoyed. And he says, a lovely deer, a graceful doe, let her breasts fill you at all times with delight. Be in last service, someone amen. It was awkward, right? And so... Uh, and it is tricky the all times. There is a time that it's awkward, like in church, right? And so uh, let her breasts fill you at all times with delight, be intoxicated always in her love. Now here's the thing, marriage isn't, all, isn't just passion, it's commitment, it's duty, it's friendship, it's serving one another, it's putting one another first. But, but there is this, this thing about, about prioritizing that side of it, that the best cure for sex outside of marriage is sex inside of marriage. And so make time for friendship. And listen, a passion could even look like just kissing more. I, I, I came across this, this study. It says that men who kiss their wives in the morning before work live five years longer than those who don't. And, it's, and it's, the study found that those who kiss their spouse each morning often don't miss work because of illness. On um, the way to work, their chances of accidents are also fewer, and they earn 20 to 30% more money. If you want your husband to make more money, just give him a good kiss in the morning. And they live about five years longer than those who don't get a kiss before work. Let me give you some other good truths about kissing. Kissing burns calories. A, a long, enjoyable kiss burns about 100 calories an hour. If you do that every day, you will lose three pounds a year. Kissing is heart friendly. Australian research says that, that, that a, a long, passionate kiss helps to regulate the heartbeat and lowers blood pressure. Kissing can actually make you look younger. It, uh, it's, it, uh, it, it levels the physiological activity, rises in our face, softens lines, wrinkles, and multiplies circulation in the face. It's been shown to help alleviate allergies. According to research, kissing <laughs> slows down the growth of, of, of IgE antibodies in the blood. These antibodies release histamine. Don't take Benadryl, just kiss passionately. And so... Uh, if you wanted to kiss, you could just ask. All right, all right. And so... Uh, How do I look? Do I look younger? Um, <laughs> All right, Claire, give us the next point. I do think that's really true. I just want to just piggyback on that, that you have to be intentional. It is almost like a fight. And the more kids we have in our home, it feels like a harder and harder fight for that time. Um, not just time away, but also just attention day to day. Like to look at your spouse in the eyes and just give them attention day to day, saying, I like you and noticing them in the midst of life's craziness. It's, it, you have to be super, super, super intentional about that. The fourth difference maker in your marriage is to pursue oneness and spiritual unity. This is huge. You saw the verse earlier about how um, God made man and woman when they came together to be one flesh. And that is God's design for our marriage, to be one flesh, to be that close and have that kind of unity. 
the most important area that is spiritual unity. And listen, if you got maybe got saved after you got married or um, you and your spouse were not in the same place um, in this area, just keep praying that God will work in that um, and continue in your walk with the Lord. But if you are sharing, you, you and your spouse are both believers, it's super, super important, not just that you're both believers, but how you bring God into your marriage, to have spiritual unity in your marriage. Ecclesiastes 4.12 says, though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. You have to bring God into every area of your marriage. Don't compartmentalize it like a waffle, but bring him in like this braid it's talking about where he is impacting every decision, every area of your lives together. And some ways to grow in spiritual unity are you personally um, pursuing your relationship with God. I will tell you, there are times where I know in my head I'm supposed to forgive Dave or I'm supposed to apologize or there's some situation that we're not seeing eye to eye on that no matter what he said, it wouldn't change my mind, but God spoke into my heart in those times where I get alone with God and God softens my heart and makes me able to be the wife that Dave needs. And so pursue God yourself, do it together, go to church together as you are today, serving, pray together on a regular basis, join a life group together. Those are coming up in just a couple of weeks. Um, Make sure you're nurturing your spiritual unity. Also, there's physical unity um, as far as intimacy is concerned. A lot of times that's a symptom of disunity in another area of your relationship. So if you're struggling there, look at what else is going on in your relationship and yeah, try typically, to pursue that. Typically women have sex because they feel close and men have sex in order to feel close, typically as a stereotype. Yeah, that's, that's true. And so either way, you're having, there's something wrong if you're not... Um, if you're not having an active sex life or you don't have intimacy. And there's other reasons too, obviously, physical reasons and things like that that might be a challenge. But it's good, like you were saying, to foster that passion for one another. And then there's also, you need to be, have unity in parenting. If you have kids, this is huge. Discuss your priorities and your roles. Um, honor your spouse publicly. Disagree with them privately. It's you against them, guys. And the more of them there are, the closer you need to be to, to fight that battle and to raise them up to be the kids that you want them to be. You need to have unity in that and have communication about what that looks like. The last thing that is huge is missional unity in your marriage. You need to have a vision for your marriage and also like have a mission, a purpose uh, for your marriage. There's so many uh, people that I've seen that get married that are these amazing like power couples when they come together. They can do more together than they can by themselves. And I really think that is part of the reason why God put you with your spouse is that you can do more for the kingdom together than you can apart. And so many times we just lose sight of that in everyday life. And nothing brings you closer together than being on mission together. So when you have some conversations, some things you can ask are, what are your passions? And where do they, where do they cross? Where do they unite? How can you fuel them together? What legacy do you want to leave for your kids? What legacy do you want to leave for the kingdom? You know, Francis Chan said, you can have a fun but worthless marriage. And I don't know about you, we have a lot of fun, but I do not want to have a worthless marriage. I want to have a marriage that makes a difference for the kingdom. It's good. Um, final point, and we're done. Uh, if, uh, if a difference maker in your marriage would be to keep short accounts, don't let your heart get hard. Let me show you Matthew chapter 19, um, verse 3. The Pharisees came up to Jesus and tested him by saying, is it lawful to divorce one's wife for any cause? And they were trying to trick him up by the language there. And, and there were people in the ancient world that just thought that, that a man could just divorce his wife literally if he didn't like dinner that night. Um, it's a, which leads to a lot of instability, but better dinner. Um, and so, uh, but that it was people could just get divorced for any old reason. And, uh, and so they're trying to trick up Jesus. And Jesus answered, have you not read that he, cre he created them from the beginning, made them male and female? So Jesus here is going to give a strong endorsement of marriage and, and said, therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and they shall become one flesh. It's this unity thing. So they're no longer two, but one flesh. But therefore, God is joined together. Let not man separate. And they said to them, why then did Moses command one to give a certificate of divorce and to send 
her away. And then Jesus said, because of your hardness of heart, Moses allowed. He says, Moses didn't command. Moses allowed you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. So in the ancient world, what would happen is, is because patriarchal society, a man gets tired of his wife, says, I divorce you. Um, and it would just be a verbal thing. I, we're divorced. And then you get out of here. And then she would go and remarry another man. And then he would come back around and say, what are you doing? You're still my wife. And, and you're committing adultery because there was no, no written legal certificate of divorce. And so because, and then what that would lead to is women would end up being unable to remarry. Somebody wouldn't remarry them. And so then they're just living in poverty and it's a terrible situation for women and children. So it was an effort to, because of people's hardness of heart, the sin in their hearts, because, to, in order to protect women and children, Moses said, hey, if you're going to get divorced, it's not God's heart, not God's intent, but because of the hardness of your heart, make it official, a certificate of divorce. So then that, that woman is then free to remarry. It was a measure to protect women and children, but it was never God's intent. Jesus says, this was never how it was supposed to be, but it was because of the hardness of your heart. And so what happens when our hearts get hard towards God and towards our spouse, and we have a lot of unresolved conflict, and we have disagreements that we never worked through, and we have hurts and offenses that we've never released and forgiven, what happens is bitterness takes root, our hearts get hard, and then we end up just throwing in the towel. And so what we, what we see here is, uh, Rick Warren said it this way, he said, a great marriage is a union of two great forgivers. Now, I don't do a lot of ongoing marriage counseling. Uh, I will many times meet with a couple one time and then refer them to one of our other pastors or, or, or a professional therapist, big believer in counseling. But, but honestly, I, I just fundamentally believe that, that about 95% of marital difficulty can, can, be, can be summed up and dealt with if people would just obey two key scriptures, right? And so in Philippians chapter 2, Paul, Paul says, hey, if you're even a Christian, he, he, he says that then that, 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 that live in humility, uh, putting the needs of one another before yourself, counting each other of higher regard than yourself. And so I fundamentally believe if you've got two Christians who with God's help are seeking to put the needs of the other person before themselves and to consider the other person of higher regard than themselves and putting their needs. If you've got two people that love Jesus with God's help seeking to put the needs of the other one before themselves, so much marriage stuff gets dealt with. And then the other key scripture is here in Ephesians chapter 4. Let me read it to you. Four, verse 31. Here's what Paul says. He says, let all bitterness, so many marriages are just marked by bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. But then if it's, it says, man, just put away all that bitterness and anger, put all that stuff away. Instead, be kind to one another. So much of marriage, it would just go better if two people with God's help would just be kind to each other. Putting the needs of the other one before their own. Tender hearted, the opposite of having a hard heart is having a tender heart. Forgiving one another as God and Christ forgave you. I just fundamentally believe that any, if you have two Christians who are saying, with God's help, I'm going to do my best to put the needs of my spouse before my own. I'm going to, put that, I'm going to consider them of higher regard than my own self. I'm, going to, I'm not going to hold on to anger and bitterness. Instead, I'm going to be kind and tenderhearted and forgiving. I'm telling you, 95% of all marital difficulty can be dealt with. Now, sometimes it's valuable to, to, ha to have a therapist or a counselor come alongside and to help you live that out with some accountability and some practical tips. But man, at the end of the day, it's just living that stuff out. And so Jesus says, why do people get divorced? It's a hard heart. Well, what marriage expert John Gottman calls this is he calls this the four signs of uh, the four horsemen of the marriage apocalypse. He describes it looking like this. The, the, the first step is criticism. When, all, when we begin to see the worst in our spouse over and over again, our marriage is in trouble. It's a sign of a hard heart. See, there's a difference between having a complaint and then having a spirit of criticism between you and your spouse. See, what a complaint does is it focus, focuses on a specific behavior or event. A complaint looks like this. I'm really angry that you didn't sweep the kitchen last night. We agreed that we'd take turns. Could you please do it now? See, like many complaints, it has three parts. Here, here's how I feel. I'm really angry about a specific situation. You didn't sleep last night. And here's what I want, need, or prefer. Could you please do it now? And contrast, the spirit of criticism is global and expresses negative feelings or opinions about the other's character or personality. Why are you so forgetful? Or why are you such a slob? Or why are you such a lazy butt? You know, that kind of thing. Why? Laugh with me, folks. And he says, why are you so forgetful? I hate having to always 
sweep the kitchen floor when it's your turn. You just don't care. See, it's no longer about an event. Now it's about character. It's no longer about a one-time situation. Now it's about always and never. It's the spirit of criticism. It's a sign of a hard heart. The next thing is contempt. What contempt, he says, you go from criticism to contempt, but now it's just a, a disrespectful, you kind of begin to see the other person as less than. Am I, am I getting in your space with my, um, and uh, uh, the second horseman arises from a sense of, it's like, and now I'm, I'm the better person. You're the, you're the worst person. It's this, this disrespect thing. It's fueled by long-term simmering negative thoughts. The third is defensiveness. So these things build on one another. Defensiveness says it's not my fault. The defensiveness always wants to turn it on the other person. The problem isn't me, it's you. This defensiveness, it's a sign, and it just causes to escalate the conflict. It's a sign of this hardening, hardening of the heart. And the final thing is stonewalling. Uh, see, some people say, you know, me and my spouse never argue. Well, that might be because one of you is incredibly easy to get along with. It's about 1% of the time. It might be because you're in a season of just a, a really pleasant time in your marriage, and that lasts a very short season of marriage. More likely, more likely, especially if these other things have been a part of your history of criticism and defensiveness and contempt, more likely what's happened is at least one of you's given up. And you say, well, the last five times we had this conversation, it ended bad and talking about it never helps. So I'm just not going to talk about it. And I don't want to fight about it. And so in your attempt to walk away from the fight and just stonewall, what, what's, what you're actually doing is you're walking away from your marriage. And, 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 it's, and many times this can be the sign where, where, where your marriage is in like marital ICU. And so what John Gottman calls these, the, the, the four horsemen of the apocalypse, is what Jesus is describing about these hardness of our hearts, where, where our hearts get hard towards God and towards our spouse. And, and, and we're no longer walking in the pattern that we should walk in. See, for Christians, what marriage should look like is this constant cycle of sin. And, and not, that, not that sin should be the constant, but you've got two sinners coming together. There's going to be some sin, right? Sin followed by repentance, followed not by defensiveness, but by owning it and saying, hey, when I did this, man, I know it hurt you, and I'm so sorry, and by God's grace, I, I'm, I'm going to stop doing that. So it's sin, not followed by, not by defensiveness, but by repentance, and then not by bitterness, but by grace and forgiveness, that marriage is this constant cycle where someone hurts the other, someone, someone sins against the other, disappoints the other, unmet expectations, their sin, followed by repentance, followed by just lavishing of grace and forgiveness. And listen, I don't know where your marriage is. Maybe you're in an incredible moment. Maybe this is the best moment your marriage has ever had. And if that's the case, I just celebrate that with you. I encourage you to steer into that slide, build on this season. Those seasons are incredibly sweet. Or maybe you say, you know what? We're, not, we're in a spot where things aren't necessarily bad, but I know they've been better before. And, and if that's the case, maybe even at, during this morning's talk, you were like, you know what? Man, we did used to have a regular date night, and we've gotten out of the habit with kids and work, and man, let's go back to doing that thing. And we really did used to work to encourage each other more and to, and to, and to affirm each other more. And let's, I, I could get back into that habit, and, and maybe that's, that's you, or maybe you're here, in a moment at, you're here in a moment in your marriage of incredible difficulty. Well, where, wherever you're at, I just want us to take a moment and let's go to God with that stuff. Let's pray. And like I said, if you're here in a great moment, maybe you're newlywed or maybe you've been married like Ken and April, like decades and decades, and you say it's, this is the sweetest moment in our marriage, and man, I just celebrate that with you and encourage you to, to keep doing the things that you're doing. Enjoy this season. But, but maybe you say, you know what, I, we are here. And it's not that things are bad, but there's, I definitely know that there's been moments that have been better. And even, as a, a, even in this message this morning, maybe God has kind of prompted your heart of some things, some things that you can do. Maybe one of these five or maybe something else, some things that you can do. That if you did them, that, that, that your marriage could be better than ever. And, and maybe that's, there's a, something in your heart where like, that's what I want more than ever. And I'm going to do those things. Maybe you're sitting next to your spouse. Maybe you're even holding hands right now or have your hand on their leg. And, but if that's what's inside your heart right now, where you're saying, you know what? It's not that things are terrible, but I know they can be better. And, and, and with God's help, man, I'm going to do everything I can to, for it to be better than ever. If that's you, you can even just squeeze your spouse's hand or leg. But I know some of you are here. And, you, and the idea of... of 
of even being married another decade or even another year or another month. You wonder if you can even do it. And, you, and, and you've even lost hope. You say, man, I, I just don't have a lot of hope that, that we can do this another 20, 30 years. Or maybe you just say, you know what, I'm, just, I'm really low on hope that it could ever be great. Man, we're going to stay married because it's the right thing, and we took a vow before God and our family and friends. We're going to stay married, but I've lost hope that it could ever be so good that somebody would look at the way in which we love each other, and it would make them see a picture of God's love for us in Christ. And so, Father, I want to pray for those people who, who, who their hope is low, low that they can do this for the long haul, or low that it could ever really be great. And Father, I, I just pray that, that you would turn husbands and wives' hearts towards yourself. And God, that you turn the hearts of husbands towards their wives, and the hearts of wives towards their husbands. And God, where there needs to be real, honest to goodness repentance, where defensiveness and, and casting blame on others needs to go away and there just needs to be real repentance, maybe over some really big stuff or maybe over just a whole bunch of small stuff, but there needs to be real repentance where, where husbands look at their wives and wives look at their husbands and say, you know what, man, I did this thing and I've done these things and I know that it's really hurt you and I'm really sorry and with God's help, I'm not gonna do that again. Where repentance needs to happen, I pray that you'd bring it about. And God, where, where there needs to be a lavish display of grace and forgiveness, the kind of display that, that, that reminds us of the cross. God, where there needs to be a lavish display of grace and forgiveness, where, where a spouse looks at the other and says, you know what, I forgive you. And I'm not gonna dwell on that anymore. And I'm not going to bring that up anymore. And I'm giving up my right to be angry and to get even. And it's not going to be between us anymore. And I am choosing with God's help to let that go. God, where there needs to be a radical display of grace and forgiveness, I pray that you'd bring that to pass. And God, I, I pray where hope is low and where hope is gone. God, that by your Holy Spirit, you would infuse husbands and wives with hope. God, that they would have the knowledge that, that you're the God who raised Jesus from the dead, who one day will raise us from the dead, who can raise from the dead, dead marriages when husbands and wives will come to you. So God, that's our prayer. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.